questions. I'm going to hit record. Today she doesn't speak to us. Another day she does. She spoke <laughs> to me. One out, I'll let you know. Huh? She spoke. I heard her. Did you? Oh, I didn't. Yeah. Hear. She didn't say anything to me. She must be mad at me. Okay. So why don't we go ahead and get started? It wouldn't be the first time. And um, what we're going to do is start to talk about working capital management here. So uh, we're going to be talking about particularly, as you can see on this slide, because we've already talked about cash accounts receivable a little bit. Now we're going to talk about inventory management, and then we're going to move our way uh, into the back part of chapter two, which is really kind of a segue into chapter three that we'll get, in, get into next time when we start talking about different uh, methods uh, for evaluating investments um, using uh, net present value method, using um, something called the payback method, and then we'll talk about internal rate of return. We're going to see there's a couple of modules there, guys, that unfortunately I'm going to ask you to go through on your own. The reason being that it starts getting into business valuation. And I just feel like at some point I'm calling out formula after formula after formula for doing that. And I think our time can be better spent uh, talking about things that have more of an accounting mechanical process to them. So that's what we're gonna do with these uh, couple of modules that we're looking at now. So let me go ahead and put us into the full screen mode. And let's start to take a look at different inventory considerations. And they start talking about the types of inventory here. We're gonna really focus in more on this in uh, chapter three. So don't worry about this right now. What they're really getting into is these inventory valuation methods, okay? And uh, you know that we have what? We have last in, first out. We have what? First in, first out. We have weighted average, et cetera. And what we need to do is value our inventory at the lower of cost or market or the lower of cost or net realizable value. And you choose either market or net realizable value depending on what inventory method you're using. So take a look. You say that when the value of the inventory falls below its original cost. So what does that mean? If the inventory's value has not fallen below its, lower, its original cost, we will use the cost to value the inventory on the balance sheet. If it falls below, the inventory must be restated to the lower of market value. And that's the case if we're using um, LIFO or uh, retail, uh, LIFO retail method or net realizable value. We use net realizable value if we're using any other inventory method other than, and you can see here, inventory costed using LIFO or the retail inventory method is measured at the lower cost for a market. If we are sitting here and using any other method, any other method, and let's just kind of call a couple out, some of the common ones, FIFO, weighted average, okay? If we are using any other method, then we will measure at the lower cost or net realizable value. So we're always comparing against cost. We will either compare the cost to the market or the net realizable value. If the cost is lower, we're reporting the cost. If the market for life on retail method is lower, we use the market. If the net realizable value is lower for any other method, FIFO weighted average, we'll use the net realizable value. Now, when we're doing the lower of cost or market, okay, lower cost or market, okay, the way that we calculate the market is a little bit, uh, I don't know, convoluted to a certain extent, okay? So the most important thing that you need to do is flashcard how to calculate market ceiling and how to calculate market floor. So what happens? We have a cost for our inventory. And we want to see if the market is below the cost, because if the market is below the cost, then we have to use the market. But how have the accounting standards defined market? Well, what they do is they say, well, your market, you're going to use that if it's lower than the cost, will be your replacement cost. 
But before you can just go with replacement cost, you have to compare it to a market ceiling or a market floor. If the replacement cost is over the ceiling, you should use the ceiling. If it's below the floor, you should use the floor. In other words, you'll use what? The middle amount between the replacement cost, market ceiling, market floor, okay? Now, the hardest thing here to me, and I was when taking, I was taking the CPA exam, we had to deal with this for the FAR section, and it still is in the FAR section. I could never remember how to calculate ceiling or floor. And I already told you those you have to flashcard. Okay, you need the flashcard, how to calculate the ceiling, how to calculate the floor, then these are easy. Okay, so the way you calculate the ceiling is to take the selling price, less cost to complete and dispose, net selling price. So if there's any discounts, you have to take that off. Net selling price, net selling price less cost to complete and dispose. Well, what are costs to complete and dispose? When I was studying for this, I mean, you mean like to throw it away? What do you mean uh, dispose? Well, that means that if you have to pay some delivery charges to get it to market, et cetera, you're going to subtract that off the net, uh, the uh, net selling price. That's going to be your market ceiling. That is also equivalent to your net realizable value. Notice they tell us here that net realizable value okay is this uh, identical to how you calculate the market ceiling okay now when you want to do the floor you take that market ceiling and now you subtract a normal profit off of that that becomes the floor then you take the replacement cost if the replacement cost is over the ceiling use the ceiling if it's below the floor use the floor if it's not over the ceiling and not below the floor you can use the net realizable value as your market and again you only do this when the market has done what has fallen below the cost of course you'd have to go through this analysis to see if the market has fallen below the cost if the market is lower use the market if the cost is lower use the cost and then for all other inventory methods you're going to do what you're simply going to use the lower of cost or net realizable value so you have that net realizable value, which you know how to calculate now because you know how to calculate the ceiling. That is what you would use to compare against the cost. Net realizable value is lower, reported net realizable value. Cost is lower, reported cost. Okay. Now we go through all that and it sounds a little bit like I'm trying to auction off something here. So let's just look at the numbers here. And I think you'll see that once you put some numbers to this, it's pretty easy. Okay, you just gotta make sure you have those flashcards to calculate the market ceiling, market floor. So we've got this company and they purchase inventory for $55 per unit. The current replacement cost is $48 per unit. And okay, now when I see that, I'm gonna take that 48 and I'm gonna put it off to the side because I know I have to evaluate that against the market ceiling and the market floor. The net selling price, less cost to complete, net realizable value. Thank you. They just came right out in this question. I didn't have to calculate anything and told me C equals ceiling. The ceiling is 51. They tell me the normal profit is what is five. So to get my floor, my floor, F is floor, is going to be 46. So I look and now what? Now my replacement cost is not over the ceiling, it's not below the floor, so I'm gonna use what? That as my market, okay? So my market, I'm putting an M there for market, it's right here, it's 48. Since my cost is 55, then I'm going to carry that at what? I'm gonna carry that at 48 because my market is below my cost, okay? If I was using any other inventory method, say FIFO, then I'm going to put it the lower cost or net realizable value. So I would put that at 51. That's what I would report on the balance sheet. Question. Okay, good. All right. Uh, by the way, this stuff is also talked about in FAR. Okay. And this could be a potential, um, I'm gonna put also in far, okay? But this could be a potential what? 
a potential um, written communication question. And you may even see something like that in your homework for this chapter where they'll have you trying out a written communication simulation talking about this kind of stuff. Lower cost or market, lower cost or net realizable value. And they like to do that because now they sit there and they say, oh, okay, you know, we can ask about, they like to say that they could ask about any part of the exam on the BEC written communication section. This is an example where this is really more of a FAR issue. Um, but, you know, they like to ask about it in written communication, okay? And that's also the case uh, when we start talking about the impact that the different cost flow assumptions, FIFO, LIFO, have on the uh, balance sheet and the income statement, okay? So when you look down here, and I want you to flashcard this, and these flashcards would also be relevant to uh, FAR, but here, this could be, again, an example of a written communication question. They say that ending inventory under first in, first out. Okay, guys, I'm going to slow down a little bit here. I think you know this, but I don't want to go too fast. Under first in, first out, what happens? The most recent items you purchase, you will say, are still in ending inventory, whereas what things you bought back when, first in, first out, that you bought earlier those are the first things that are sold so what happens that means that ending inventory on the balance sheet includes the most recent recently incurred cost and therefore approximates replacement costs so what i want you to do with that flashcard right there is list that as an advantage that is an advantage of FIFO. Okay, you can even put balance sheet and do a highly technical drawing there. The balance sheet, FIFO is good to the balance sheet because the balance sheet is pretty much showing what you most recently paid for the inventory. So inventory is pretty much already being carried at replacement cost. There should not be a big difference between the market and the cost under uh, FIFO. Now, what happens, a disadvantage of FIFO, and we're going to use it, I'm just going back to the same color here, but that's all right. The, uh, what, the, um, uh, okay, they don't call it out, so I guess I got to call it out. Uh, a disadvantage of FIFO is that cost of goods sold will be understated. Now, again, this assumes rising prices, which is typically what's assumed. But what happens if we're using first in, first out, and we're saying things that we bought maybe a year ago, okay, that those are the things that we just sold to. So we're reporting cost of goods sold and you know we are in an inflationary environment we all, almost always are you know they say oh inflation is going crazy oh, so. meanwhile and the analysis is a little flabby that i see because they say well they say we have an increase in price levels and they're saying and they compare between 2019 and 2020 to 2020 to 2021 well that's not a very good analysis because, well, but wait a minute, we had an unprecedented shutdown in the economy that happened in, 19, in 2019 to 2020. Shouldn't we really be comparing, well, what is inflation like in this year from periods before the pandemic? And I haven't seen any analysis like that. So I don't know if they're saying that that, that, that is where they're getting their inflationary concerns. But we typically have inflation, okay? So uh, over time, right? So we usually assume inflation. So what happens? Those goods that we bought before were at a lower cost. And so what happens? Since we're saying those goods that we bought before are the first ones sold, then that means that cost of goods sold is showing what? Old prices. Therefore, disadvantage of FIFO, which you can put on the flashcard, 
is that what cost of goods sold is going to be understated. In other words, the income statement is what is going to be said because it's again the technical drawing because we're putting older information on the income statement. Okay. Now you take a look at this uh, discussion on LIFO. Okay. And LIFO, the ending inventory. So again, I think you know this, but under LIFO, we say that the what the most recent costs first go to cost of goods sold, and we have sitting on our balance sheet what the cost of things that we bought a long time ago. So what happens? The ending inventory balance typically does not approximate replacement costs. So what happens? That becomes a dis advantage of LIFO. Okay, I don't think I'm going to be able to turn that attempted F into an I. Okay, turns uh, disadvantage of LIFO. But what the, um, and they don't, they don't talk about the income statement here. Okay, so I guess I have to write it in. An advantage of LIFO is that what? Cost of goods sold, cost of goods sold approximates current costs. So that means that what <clears throat> the income statement is good. Okay, <clears throat> now <clears throat> you guys had asked me before about talking about how to answer um, written communication questions, and then I think some folks saw that they're doing that on the videos and stuff. So that's fine. But let me say one thing: this would be an example that if they talk to you about talk about the advantages, disadvantages of any one of these methods, LIFO, FIFO, they may call one out or they may ask for comparison. That question gives you an opportunity to what? Talk about four to six different elements because you could come in and compare, even if they're asking you about LIFO, compare it to FIFO, talk about advantage, disadvantage. So you've got two inventory methods. That's why I'm gonna keep holding up four fingers. You've got inventory, you've got, two inventory methods, and you've got what? Two different things that you could talk about advantage, disadvantage. So that's four elements that you could talk about as you're using good grammar, as you keep calling out the words FIFO, LIFO, right? Inventory, advantage, disadvantage. And each time you call one of those things out, you're gonna hear a little bell ringing in your head. That bell ringing in your head is points gathering as you go through and quickly get the points on there. Okay. All right. Good. You could even talk about weighted average in that discussion if you want to. Okay. All right. Good. Question. Okay. Good. So let's just go ahead then and talk about inventory management strategies. Okay. And why don't you go ahead and flash card the different factors that we have to think about when managing inventory. Okay, because what happens? We sit there and we say, well, we want to make sure that we always have an item in inventory in case a customer walks in and asks for swimming trunks in the middle of winter or something, right? Well, what happens? Well, there's going to be storage and insurance costs associated with that. So we turn around and we say, okay, just order enough swimming trunks to get us through, you know, the summer. And then it turns out to be a really hot summer where everybody wants to swim. And we run out of our inventory of swimming trunks in June. Okay, well, now we have what? We may have saved us some storage and insurance costs, but we have opportunity costs. Okay, so we say, okay, well, let's get a bunch of, you know, extra swimsuits to be able to sell so we can get all the way through, um, you know, September. And then it turns out that we're left with a bunch of swimsuits. And this year's swimsuit has a mask attached to it. Next year's, nobody wants a mask, whatever. I don't know how you attach a swimsuit to a mask, but whatever, okay? So as things change, you're going to sit there and you're going to have a different, uh, you know, 
this fashion and stuff. So inventory could become obsolete. Okay, so what do we do? We're going to sit here, we're going to look at these different factors that can drive our inventory cost and see if we can minimize the costs associated with that. So one method is to look at this notion of a of, um, reorder point. Okay, so what do we do? We're going to try to come up with a projection of a good time to order inventory. And I don't want to say minimize our inventory costs because if I say that, that invokes the notion that I should be able to take some sort of mathematical formula and literally minimize that. But I, I think you got to take like the second derivative of formula to minimize it or something. And we're not getting into all that in this particular case, but we are trying to sit there and figure out a strategy for keeping those inventory costs down. I want to say minimize them, okay? And one of these is the reorder point. So with the reorder point, the inventory level at which the company should order or manufacture additional inventory to meet demand to invert incurring stock out costs. The reorder point can be calculated using the following formula. And again, guys, this is not a scientifically derived formula. It simply says what? You have a certain amount of safety stock. That safety stock is the amount that you hold that you think will you'll never sell more than that. You'll never sell out of that. Then you go ahead and you figure out what your lead time is. How long does it take you to get an inventory shipment in? You multiply that by the amount of sales that'll happen during that uh, lead time, add that to your little safety stock, and that would be a good way of trying to control those costs. Again, I wanna stay away from the word minimize, because in a minute, we're gonna look at a formula that some freak figured out somewhere as to how to minimize those costs, but that's, if I say freak, some you know, buddy who had way too much time on their hands actually came up with a formula and minimized it, and we're gonna see that here in a couple seconds, okay? But this probably, would be more of the way most human beings would, you know, try to minimize some of those uh, inventory costs that we talked about. So let's just go ahead and read through this quest, this example together. Okay, so this uh, worldwide widget sells 8,000 widgets per year, manufactures widgets in groups of 1,500, requires five weeks lead time for widget production. Worldwide also maintains an absolute minimum safety stock of. 1200 okay so assuming a 50 week year and don't ask me why they assumed a 50 week year because where i come from there are 52 weeks in a year but they decided to go with 50 okay i don't know maybe they were doing this on mars or something i don't know so assume a 50 week year and constant demand compute worldwide's reorder point for widgets okay so what happens they sell an average of 150 widgets per week, 8,000 divided by this imaginary 50 weeks in a year. The reorder point is the safety stock, 1,200 widgets, which they gave us. And then they told us it's five weeks lead time, 160 widgets per week, means that they would reorder at the point that their inventory drops or uh, not reorder, but um, because they're constructing the inventory, but they would have a reorder point, and they're calling that at 2,000 units. So worldwide will manufacture additional widgets when its inventory falls to 2,000. It's not really reordering. Um, that's when they'll uh, start manufacturing additional widgets. Okay. Okay, good. Now, economic order quantity is much more scientific, okay? And so what they have is an equation. And you say, well, John, explain that equation to you, like to us. I can't explain that equation to you any more than I can explain, what is it, E equals MC squared? I mean, I look at that and I'm like, well, I know what it is, but I couldn't explain a damn thing about it to you, okay? So, I mean, I know what the things stand for in there, but I don't know what it means. Okay, well, this is the same kind of thing. And that somebody came up with a formula, and I believe what they did is they went ahead and they took some derivatives, they did some calculus on this thing to come up with this formula that minimizes the cost. So the most important thing for us is to make sure that we flashcard that. And of course, we need to know 
what the elements of that formula stand for, but it's not a hard formula to memorize. And for some weird reason, don't ask me why, I literally remember using this formula on my exam. Don't ask me why I remember that because I you know, worked a long time ago and there were a lot of questions, but I literally remember remembering this formula and using it on my exam back in 1987. I don't know why I remember that, but I did have to use it. Okay, so flashcard that. And then guys, I'm not gonna go through the detail here. It is simply a matter of plugging the elements into the formula. Okay, question. Okay, good. So let's go ahead and uh, turn our attention. There's our inventory management. We talked about cash and accounts receivable last time. Let's go ahead and take a look at another component of our working capital now, all the way over on page 37, which is going to be our accounts payable management. Let me drink some water here real quick. I'm sorry, I do have a question. I'm looking at this thing and I'm looking at the um, I'm looking at the formula, and it says annual sales in units, but what they're using in the answer is actually goes through 100 units of inventory monthly. So I guess I'm a little confused about months and years. Um, Maximus company incurs carrying costs of $50 a month and each quarter cost the firm $5,625. Calculate maximum's economic order point of maximum gets through 100 units of inventory. Oh, there's a footnote at the bottom. I'm sorry, I didn't see that. It says it calls for annual sales using monthly sales in the numerator and monthly carrying costs in the denominator will produce the same result. I'm sorry, I didn't see that. I had my hand over it. <laughs> I see, using monthly, so they used monthly and monthly? Yeah. Cost and, okay. Okay. So, sorry about that. Well, that's okay. I mean, I think these bastards should make up their mind, though. I mean, what do they, <laughs> you know, what do they want us to use? Do they want, you know, but I, I see what they're doing here that, if you run in, I mean, it's bad enough I have to memorize the formula, right? Now they're gonna start playing shell games with the formula, but um, it does give us, you know, the fact that Beck, you know, that Becker did this like this, gives us fair warning that you gotta read the question and make sure you understand, you know, are they talking monthly? Are they talking annual, you know? It sounds like you have some flexibility too. You can use this for a monthly problem and you can also use the same formula for an annual problem. You just have to make sure that your numerator and denominator are consistent. Yeah, no, I mean, that's an excellent takeaway. And um, there are problems that do that too. They do like to do that. You know, you get all hopped up on because you remembered it annually and then they throw something like this and you, you know, you sit there unprepared for it, that's why I think Becker does this so that then you see it and then you're aware that that could happen on the exam. Okay, good, good question. Okay, let's go ahead then and let's take a look at accounts payable management, okay? And uh, basically what we're going to do here is calculate the cost, the interest cost um, annual um, percentage rate of not taking advantage of discounts, okay? Now, when I teach about uh, taking discounts to introductory students, and I start talking about 10, 210, net 30 and all that, they get all bothered because they're like, oh, who cares? This is an accountant's, you know, folly. And I have heard about entire, you know, high dollar level um deals fall apart over the terms well we couldn't agree on the terms for when payments were going to be made and you know i remember a friend we were actually sitting there having a couple of drinks and he was like i can't believe this i went to all this trouble to get this thing right to the edge and then 
the terms that we fell apart on the discount terms and that screwed up my whole deal. Okay. So it's kind of a big deal when you're talking about what large dollar amounts. Okay. So the way to calculate the cost of not taking a discount, or maybe in the case of my friend, the cost of not getting the terms you want in a discount can be calculated through this formula right here. Okay, so go ahead and flashcard that formula. And then again, I don't tend to want to get into reading through an example that simply takes elements of a formula and then plugs them in, notwithstanding Kathy's point a minute ago that there might be something interesting in there that you can read through and understand about the length of time or that's being used in the problem versus what we talked about in the formula. Okay. All right, good. So with all that, let's go ahead and take a look at our couple of multiple choice questions for today. And um, let's take a look at uh, question one and we'll get into question two. Let me put the poll up. Okay, guys, let's go ahead and wrap this up. About half of you have had a chance to look at this. So, um, okay, I'm gonna go ahead and end the poll. And uh, I'm not sure what six folks are doing, seven folks, five folks are doing what they need to answer this, but uh, let's just go ahead and let's take a look at this. And um, most of us got it right. Okay, 62%, but there seems to be a little bit of attraction to A, only one person chose B. So I'm gonna go through the question here. I don't even know if I can call it going through because it's plugging the numbers into the formula. So maybe you made a mistake with the formula, but if someone wants to share with me how they got 24% after I go through it, that's fine. Um, but let's go ahead and let's just take a look. Okay, so the correct answer is 36.7%. And guys, what I'm doing is I'm looking at the formula, okay? And I know that I have to have what? I know that I have to have 360, and they use a 360-day year here again. 
when they're getting into financial calculations, they use a 360 day year. And then I have to take the pay period, which looking at this question is 30 days. And then I have to go ahead, what the heck? Oh, don't start this nonsense. Ah, I hate when the thing starts acting like a fool. Okay, and so we have what? We have 30. Okay, and then minus the what 10 day two ten net 30 right okay and then we have to multiply that and we take the discount okay and we tell me two percent so i'm not sure maybe you just remembered one percent from the example you have there but you take the discount whatever that is and then a hundred minus the discount so a hundred percent right minus the two percent discount okay and when you do the math on that i'm not going to go through all the details of the math you get this 36.7 right you guys got it you got it right okay uh did somebody do something different to led you to the 24? I just didn't follow it all the way through. I got to the point, the 20.4, and then I was like, well, wait a minute, that's not an answer. So you just do the whole formula. Okay. Okay. I goofed and conflated my variables from the last problem. <laughs> So yeah. it's a copying over problem. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I was thinking that might have been that if you put 1%, let's say it's not always 1%. Um, it reminds me when I was in the seventh grade, we had a math teacher that we weren't understanding at all. Of course, she had the disadvantage of being a math teacher at Hayward, in school at Hayward. But anyway, uh, so she showed us and the answer was five on one of the problems and then one of the poor kids said will the answer always be five okay so you can't always use the same effort that you see in the solution right you have to deal with variables okay good let's take a look with um, at number two sometimes it's the case right it's the same number but for example that 360 days in a year but the other numbers you gotta change accordingly Okay, good. Let's go ahead and uh, take a look at the next question. Ask a question about the first problem. Yeah. Um, for the purpose of the exam, how many decimal places should we typically take things out to? Because when I look at the universe of possible mistakes under the theory that if there is a possible mistake, I will make it, uh, 
if you just went, if you didn't carry the um, the two percent divided by uh, 100 minus two percent out to four decimals, you would have gotten 0 0.02, and you would have multiplied 18 times 0 0.02, and you would have come up with the 36 percent instead of the 36.7 percent. Kathy Becker created this question. I can look at those choices and tell you that right off the top of my head. There is no way that there was a CPA exam question that got into differences of percentages of a 0.7 and a 0.5. And I had noticed that about the choices before. <clears throat> Do you ask that? This was not a released question. No way. This okay. was a question that somebody in Becker invented. And for all I know, this person was an alcoholic. Okay, I don't know where they came up, why they would have sat there and, you know, they're having a powerful hangover the day they did this. I don't understand why they would have confused the candidate with having answers that are that close. Um, so on the exam, you are going to have one clear right answer. They are not interested in your rounding ability. They're going to give you an answer that is correct you know, obviously correct, if you do the formula correctly. Mm, I, I, that's good to know because on the simulations, um, I noticed I got some things wrong because of a rounding error. And um, I just was curious about that. I said, geez, how many, how many decimal places do we have to take this damn thing out to? <laughs> uh, that is not uh, unique to Becker. A lot of learning management systems have that problem because it's hard to tell a computer to give, you know, something credit for which there's you know um you know potential different way of rounding whereas the software that the exam uses to uh is to grade the exam doesn't have that problem the exam software uh, basically is much more sophisticated so again if becker's dinging you like I've seen some Becker ones where they ding you because you didn't put the debits and credits in the same order that the question anticipated. Obviously, that's nonsense. I mean, we don't have journal reviews, <laughs> but when you get to the other parts, guys that have gone through the FAR, did you see that sometimes where it marked you wrong because you didn't put the journal entry in the exact order? Um, you know, but those kinds of things don't happen on the exam. Okay, good. So taking a look at this question um, now, and um, most of us got it right, okay, 65% of us, but let's look through these. Oh, it might help if I share the results, okay? So the answer is B, uh, that's correct. But let's look through these and think about, um, you know, why the right answer is right, and of course the wrong answers are wrong. So, um, let me just get this out of my way. My computer is going to look like a fool here all night, I guess. But I'm um, taking a look at question two. Uh, the correct answer here is B. So an increase in the cost of which of the following would cause management to reduce the average inventory. In other words, do what? Carry less inventory. Let me get that to a while. I'm not sure I broke out of here. Um, I think I relaunched it. You don't have to read take that okay so let's get that off the screen okay so an average in which of the following would cause management to reduce the average inventory and what happens in other words reduce the amount of inventory they carry well the cost of placing an order if that increases that's going to want you to do what that's going to want you to carry more inventory so you don't have to keep ordering the inventory okay so that one is not it that's going to basically cause you to carry more inventory because you don't want to have to keep it ordering it. We know that B is the correct answer. Let's look at C though, the annual demand for the product. Well, if we have a high demand for the product, then what? We're not going to reduce the amount because now we're going to have all these people walking in saying they want the thing and we don't have it. They're going to say, great, I'll go over to Kmart. And get it. Well, is Kmart still in business? I'll go to another place and get it, right? Okay. D, the lead time needed to acquire inventory. Well, if that's the case, it takes us a while to get the inventory to our premises. We have to produce it or it's coming from overseas or something. Well, if that's the case, then what? Then we're going to want to carry more inventory so that we have it available. 
what's going to cause us to want to reduce the average inventory is the cost of carrying inventory. And one of two things are going to, or a couple of different things are going to affect that. One would be the cost of storage. The other would be if we have to carry insurance, or the other would be if the inventory is experiencing a high degree of shrinkage. Um, maybe the inventory spoils. Maybe it's a food product of some sort. Maybe people steal our stuff. Maybe we have high price, small size inventory items that are easy to steal and fairly fungible when they get out of the street. So you're going to want to reduce the amount of the inventory you carry. Question? Okay, good. All right, so that's the logic of those. Um, what I'm going to do, guys, at this point is take a quick break. Okay, I'm going to see if I can get my uh, computer to get rid of some of this sluggishness. But before I do, I am not going through module five and six with you. I find that the valuation discussion is formula after formula. Now, my advice, though, for these two sections is that you look at the recording of those and you look through your flashcards to see the formula that you have there and then go ahead and apply those formula and coming up with the different ways to value um, the stock of a company. I'm not doing that here because it starts to just become, um, you know, example of example of plugging items in to a formula and sitting there and figuring these things out, days and accounts receivable, et cetera. We're not gonna do those things, okay? All right, we're better off turning our attention when we come back from the break. I'm going to uh, turn my attention to the uh, module eight, where we start using different tools to make different decisions and there's more of an analysis there that we can talk through together. Okay, so let's go ahead and take about 10 minutes and we'll come back to module eight. So are there any particular areas that you think are important to know, or is it basically just know all the formulas and how to use them? Uh, yes, to your second question. Um, okay. Yeah, I, I really, you know, I keep looking at how can I add value to these and I'm not feeling it other than to say, know this formula because- right. Ends up being, and I just I think that our time is better spent where I can actually talk to you about a couple of different ways to do the calculations that are required for looking for things in module eight, starting module eight. You can see the formulas as I'm kind of scrolling through here. Um, okay, so basically know all of the formulas in this chapter. In these three chapters, basically. Yes, with the point of looking at your flashcards to see if the formula is already there to save yeah. you from having to write it. And um, if you have it there already, fine. If not, then you're going to need to make the flashcards so that you can then apply them to the questions, apply them to the questions like Matthew's doing. I think he has a question about one of them. Uh, from the previous discussions. Uh, if you got a question about, well, look, the formula said do this, but when I tried on the problem, I couldn't get the answer or something, then I can help you there. I'd much rather approach it that way than me sitting here reading off formula after formula and then jumping into examples where we use the formula. Okay. All right, good. Let's go ahead, guys. Let's take a quick break. Um, why don't we shoot for six? 25. We'll do 15 minutes this time just so I can get my computer together here because you can see why as it's taking me this long to scroll through these pages, something's going on with my machine that's decided to get in clunky mode and so I want to try to fix that. Okay, so we'll go ahead and take the break.
Okay, guys, let's go ahead and get started back. Um, I forgot to hit pause. So if when you go to watch this again, you probably have to fast forward through that. I apologize. I was kind of trying to see if I could get my computer to start um, behaving. Hopefully I figured out what to do here, but um, I just want to make sure I'm still recording. Yeah. Okay, so you may have to fast forward through this, but um, Matthew, I looked at your question, and I think the, the uh, question that you sent me in the email that you had a question about that I said, hey, I want to look at it first. I think um, what makes this question kind of hard is you have to kind of first realize what this Spotec or Spotec or whatever the heck the name of this company is was trying to accomplish. And what they're saying is, look, can we still generate the same amount of sales, this 132,500,000, and carry lower inventory levels? The way they articulated that is by increasing their turnover. Um, inventory turnover is basically saying how many times over the course of a year would you sell out of your inventory? Now, of course, using some of the techniques that we have just talked about in our discussion today, you would fix it up so that theoretically you would get your next shipment just as you ran out of inventory, right? And you probably, that never happens, right? Because the world isn't perfect. But on average, if you can turn your inventory over more times, that means you're actually carrying lower inventory levels. And then they monetize that into a dollar cost savings by saying, well, if we're having to um, you know, have interest rates because uh, we're having to borrow the money that we're using to uh, carry our inventory levels, what would be the cost savings associated with that? And so once you've got this decrease in the average inventory, you multiply that by the 5% to get this cost savings. Yeah, that helps a little bit. I, when I first read it, I was like, what in the world does the interest rate have to do anything with the inventory turnover, at least formula-wise? I guess that's where I was confused at. But now your explanation of, hey, they got to hold that inventory, so what's that going to cost them? That makes a little bit more sense. Yeah, I mean, realistically, just from a test taking standpoint, looking at this question, I mean, if you're going to be in the you know ballpark of trying to answer this, you got to use that interest rate, right? Yeah. <laughs> Regardless of whether you understood it or not, it's kind of like I mean, we have to use that five percent. Um, to me, the hard part was just kind of knowing, getting past that, you know, they're really trying to remain, remain, if they're telling you they want to increase their turnover, it's kind of counterintuitive, then that means that they're trying to generate the same amount of sales by carrying lower inventory levels. To me, that was the leap that, that got a little, not, not a leap, but the mental calisthenics that got a little tough. That, that makes sense. Yeah, that would have definitely helped as well. I had no idea what the hell they were asking for, to be honest. Yeah. Look, you're going to run into questions like that on the exam. Um, and your best bet is not to spend a lot of time. And then the other important part of missing a question like that is you can't let it affect your emotions. Because, you know, you, you get a question like, what the hell, right? maybe you get a second question what the hell and you can't let you got to keep your head wrapped tight on these you got to keep telling yourself i'm going to get to some questions here pretty quick that i'm going to be knocking out the ballpark and you can mark the question but my rule of thumb is that you should not mark more than five questions choose your best answer okay so i so have i just luckily chose the right answer here because i want to see the solution um, choose your best answer, you know, um, and then move on. And then when you're watching your time on that test list, if you have enough time left over, then you can go back to those ones you checked. If you don't have enough time, then just move on. 
no one question is worth uh, more than you know, the average of maybe the most you should spend with any one question is three minutes. Okay. Average, your average should be about a minute and a half, but that means that some questions you might spend three minutes on other questions you're going to spend 30 seconds on like sort of that last one we looked at where there were no numbers on it. Um, yeah, go ahead. A lot of these things are like comp not complicated, but involved calculations. It's hard to get that timing down. So I just got to practice, practice, practice. Yeah, I mean, I feel like chapter two has got a lot of that um, because of the formulas and the how to apply them and whatnot. But I don't know that chapter two is a particularly heavy chapter in the exam, um, but you'd want to have as a safeguard those uh, flashcards in case you do get asked something, you've got a chance of getting through the few questions you'll get from that first part of chapter two. The most, um, to me, I can tell you that you're going to get questions in chapter two on or where we're going to turn our attention right now, which is um, looking at um, some of these different decision techniques, okay? And they're going to start out talking about cash flow, but cash flow ultimately comes down to what is the net cash flow that is provided by different uh, investment options. And um, then we're going to start to use some techniques to evaluate different investment options. Now, because investments tend to go over a period of time, we are going to start using a little more present value accounting here. And so we're going to be looking at net present value, which obviously the phrase present value lets you realize that they're using time value of money there. We're going to be talking about internal rate of return, which essentially takes the net present value method and uses it as a way of screening out any uh, investment options that don't meet a minimum hurdle rate that the company has sort of set up for accepting various projects. And we're going to talk about the payback method. Payback method does not use time value of money, but it could be used as just a quick screening tool for considering any investment. And what most companies would probably do at that point is then move into more of a discounted method like net present value or internal rate of return once they've screened some initial projects with payback. But um, we'll talk about primarily those three different methods, okay? All of this, guys, is considered capital budgeting, okay? Now, we talk about capital budgeting here to distinguish it from operational budgeting. And we'll talk about operational budgeting more in some later uh, chapters. Operational budgeting is basically preparing a cash budget and seeing if you're going to have to borrow or if you have any money to invest over a period of time. And we always start with the sales budget. When you talk about, and that typically covers a one-year period, that's an operating budget. When we talk about capital budgeting, we're talking about budgeting decisions in which the consequences are going to, the implications of that are going to go beyond just the current year. Thus, we're going to have to start considering time value of money and do some present value calculations. Now, when we look at these, we will always look at the net effect of all the cash flows, both direct and indirect associated with those different options. So I'm just going to have you write down here. We're just basically looking at what the inflows. Let me just put the word cash in front of that cash inflows versus, or we don't even have to say versus, cash inflows minus cash outflows will equal what? Net cash. And, you know, it could be the net effect, okay? It could be net cash. Typically, we're interested in a net cash inflow. Okay, we're gonna 
immediately want to reject an option that's going to end up in a net cash outflow. Why would we do this? Okay. So we're basically considering investment options could be property, plant, equipment that are going to have cash inflows that are greater than, greater than the cash outflows. Now, if you look at this on a on discounted basis, that'd be one way of looking at it, but we're going to see that we're going to be using present value and that could cause this number to uh, to turn negative and we're generally going to reject projects of that nature. Okay, so we always take a look and um, at the inflows and outflows. So let's start to get a sense as to what some of the inflows and outflows will be. Now, one of the areas that I see a common mistake is when we think about working capital. And when I say I see a common mistake, meaning I'm not correcting CPA exam papers, obviously, but uh, when I'm teaching these methods to my cost accounting students uh, at San Francisco and San Jose State, uh, a mistake that the students often make is they forget, they, they know that when working capital gets tied up at the beginning of a project, they know that they should treat that as a cash outflow. The common mistake, the common mistake is to forget that at the end of the project, any working capital that would be tied up would be released. Okay. So let's just take a look at this. Can I ask a quick question? Uh-huh. Is that like a retention you're talking about? Well, how about if I show you the outline here and then I'll give you an example of what I'm talking about. Okay. okay. So it says this may result in indirect cash outflow that is recognized at the inception of the project because part of the working capital the organization will be allocated to the investment project and will be available for other uses in the organization. Okay, now that's the consideration of cash flow, uh, working capital cash outflow at the in 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 inception of the project. Now, let me. Um, Give you an example here. Um, let's say I'm going to become involved in a project in which I'm going to need containers of some sort of lubricant or something, or some kind of oil or something, and I'm going to have to pay a deposit for those containers. Okay, so what happens? They say, well, you got to give us a million dollar deposit for the containers and at the end of the five years when you're done using this lubricant whatever for this project then you return the containers to us and we give you your deposit back so what happens the deposit is going to be tied up at the beginning of the project so that you're going to have a million dollars cash working capital that is going to be unavailable that's going to be a cash outflow and then you come down Okay, I'm just going to show you because they start cost talking about um, cash outflows down here and they kind of split the inflows versus the outflows. But notice here they tell us a working capital commitment that was recognized is the indirect cash outflow at the inception of the project is recognized as a cash inflow at the end of the project when the commitment is released. In our little example, you deter you return the containers they release your deposit back to you and so the cash flow comes back in now you know the one at the inception of the project we're probably not going to have to discount when that cash flow comes back we'd have to use the present value factor to figure out what the present value of, of that of that working capital once it's released question Okay, good. Okay, so if that answered the question we had, that's good. Okay, good. Now, also, there may be reduced working capital requirements. For example, maybe we're going to have to invest in a just-in-time inventory system, but doing that, that's going to what? That's going to result in a cash inflow at the inception of the project because we're going to be ordering our inventory on a more timely basis and we won't have any working capital tied up in carrying larger amounts of inventory. So you would need to consider that. Okay, disposal and replacement costs. So what happens? Asset abandonment. If the replaced asset is abandoned, the net salvage value is true as a reduction of the initial investment 
in the new asset. I don't really like the way they wrote that. Look, if you're sitting there and you're going to get rid of an old piece of equipment because you're contemplating buying a new piece of equipment and you can sell that old piece of equipment and get some cash now, that is a cash inflow at the inception. So I don't know why they have to say in this convoluted way is a reduction of the initial investment. Just treat it as a cash inflow at the time, zero, right? At the initiation of the project, because you're selling that old asset and you're getting some money back for it, right? Now, if they tell you they're gonna give you a trade-in value or something for that thing, then yeah, then I guess you would go ahead and subtract that off of the um, list price of the item to get what you're actually having to pay for it at the time. Okay. Okay, good. Um, the remaining book value for tax purposes is deductible as a tax loss, which reduces the liability in the year of abandonment. The tax liability decrease is considered a reduction of the new assets. Again, they say that. It's a tax saving, so you can treat it as an inflow. So if the, and again, they're considering a loss here of a, from an asset abandonment. So whatever the remaining book value was. So let's say I have an asset that's completely depreciated. It has a book value of what? A hundred. I simply, what? I simply abandon it. So let's say it's cost. Let's just go ahead. Cost is what? 500 accumulated depreciation obviously is what 400 so the book value is what 100 okay now there's not going to be any cash associated with this because we're abandoning the asset so we would have what we would go ahead and when we get rid of that asset we'll debit accumulate depreciation for four We'll credit the cost of the asset. So I'm just going to say asset for five. And that's what we paid for it back when. And to make this journal entry balance, we need a loss of 100. Well, because that loss is tax deductible now, right? So what's going to happen? We're actually going to shield a certain amount of our income from tax. So what we would do if our tax rate was, say, 20%, 30, let's say 30%, we would take what? 100% minus the 30% tax rate, okay? So we're actually what? Going to shield, actually I'm doing that wrong. We're gonna shield $100 from tax. So the $100 loss there times what? Times 0.3 would yield a $30 tax savings, that's like a cash inflow because we didn't have to pay tax on $100 worth of income. So we saved $30 of tax. So you will uh, treat that as an inflow. They keep talking about taking it off as a reduction of the initial investment, which to me adds in a different, another calculation that you don't need. You have a tax savings, you bring that in as a cash inflow. You have a situation where you sold an asset, an old asset, because you're getting a new asset. That's a cash inflow. And these cash inflows would come at the beginning of the project. Okay. Now, if you sell the asset, now what? Now um, there'll be cash received from the sale of the old asset. They keep saying that, which reduces the investment. Is a cash inflow, right? Because you're selling the thing, the cash that comes in. And then the gain or loss is going to have tax implications. So what happens if it's a gain? And now I'm not going to go through the num numeric example, guys. But now what? Uh, now the um, gain would be taxed. So now you're going to have to pay what? 30% tax on that $100. So you would have what? You would have the gain, but then you would have the... Uh, the amount of cash, I should say, that comes in, but then you'd have the tax you have to pay on the gain. If it's a loss, just as it was with the abandonment, there's going to be that tax savings associated um, with that savings, so with that cash that came in. So in that case, 
you could take whatever the cash is that you sell it for. So you sell it for a hundred dollars now, but, and you have this cash that came in, but now you have to sit there and now you could do, that's why I made the mistake before one minus the tax rate, 100 times 0.7, you're netting $70 on that cash that came in from the sale of that item. Cause you got to pay the tax on the gain. If it's a loss, then you shielded $30 from tax in that example. So now the net tax, uh, the net, the net cash impact of that selling that thing at a loss would be, you have the hundred dollars that comes in, but it's a loss. You save some tax. I'm assuming a hundred dollars gained there. So that would be one thirty. Okay. Question. Okay, good. Now, again, they keep calling that as a, against the initial investment. Um, I don't like calling it that way. Um, I just consider it an additional cash inflow that comes in when you have these uh, disposal of the assets going on. Okay. Now, the reason you're in investing probably in this item is there's going to be what? There's going to be some sort of cash flow that is generated from the investment. So I'm going to replace an older machine with a new machine because the new machine is going to have the high, uh, a lower operating costs or something, right? Uh, or I'm going to be able to produce more items. So my sales will increase, okay? But um, you know, you're not gonna invest in something that doesn't generate some sort of um, you know, cash flows in to the entity, okay? But important, when you think about the inflows, you also have to think about the inflows that are created by any tax advantage, specifically what is going to be the uh, income that is shielded by any increased depreciation that I can now take because it's going to sh that depreciation expense is going to shield so much income from tax and that's going to create a higher um, cash uh, that's going to be considered like a, um, an additional cash inflow that depreciation savings. Okay. Okay, good. Now disposal of the project. We've already talked about the uh, working capital implications, which to me is the hardest thing. The easiest mistake to make is to forget that. So make sure you flashcard that. But if the asset is sold, there's a direct effect cash inflow when you sell that asset. Okay. Uh, if the asset is scrapped or donated, there could be a tax savings. Okay. And we've already talked about the working capital considerations. Okay. Any questions on any of these? All right. Now, it's a lot of discussion, and I know that it gets a little bit like, huh, what are you talking about here? Okay. But let's just go ahead and look at some of the illustrations. And I think you'll see from looking at the illustrations, okay, I kind of see how we're going to consider these cash inflows, outflows. You practice this with the problems, you get very good at this, guys. So this stuff is not. Uh, nearly as complex as it might sound at first blush here. So let's take a look at this one. We have what? We have annual cash inflows in this example of 40,000. The depreciation on that thing is 10,000. The tax rate is what? The tax rate is 40%. Now they show us two methods. And I'm looking at that and I'm thinking, well, why wouldn't anyone just do method two? Okay, I'm not quite understanding why somebody would wanna, if I see a shorter method like that, as long as it's reasonable, I'm gonna go ahead and point to that one for you, okay? So what happens? We have a cash inflow of 40,000. They told us here's the annual cash inflow, but you gotta pay tax on your cash right that comes in and so what happens you sit here and you're really only going to get to keep 60 percent of that because after taxes of 40 percent are paid you're left with 24,000. but you've got to add back the fact that now you that you have this asset okay of 10 uh, of uh well, they didn't tell us how much they paid for it, but you might have to sit there in the problem and calculate what the annual depreciation is. But once you know that, that depreciation expense 
reduces my taxable income on this. So net, I'm actually going to have what? A tax savings of 4,000 that I would not have had had I not invested in that uh, particular asset, whatever it is contemplated in the question. And so the net um, cash inflow is 28,000. Question? Okay, good. Let's go ahead then. We've got the cash flows, I think you know, and I'm not gonna sit here guys and go through a whole big, you know, bunch of information um, that's at the end of the day going to be no more, shed no more light on that sim than that simple example did. But let's go ahead and start to talk about the discounted cash flows associated with these. Okay. Now, when you look at the discounted cash flows, we're going to talk first about net present value method, which you can see down here at the bottom of the page. And then we're going to start to get into um, a couple of different considerations of um, net present value method. Now I'm having trouble remembering after net present value method um, comes, uh, where are you? Okay, lease or buy decision, but what I'm trying to get to the more common, then we'll do payback and we'll finish with internal rate of return. I think I described it. And I don't know why, if they have a heading here of discounted cash flow models, um, it seems like then they would have wanted to go ahead and talk about all the ones that use discounted cash flows first. Anyway, let's not rewrite the book here. Let's just talk about net present value method, okay? All right, so let's look at net present value method. And uh, let's just go ahead and take a look at the calculation of the net present value. And when we're looking at net present value, we are simply looking at the cash flows. Now, it's a little bit irritating in that they tell you to ignore depreciation expense unless a tax shield, which is a way of telling you don't ignore it. Okay, so we saw how we would consider depreciation because of the tax shield but you don't consider depreciation as a subtraction of the cash flow impact of the investment because no cash is used up when you have um, the uh, uh, depreciation expense. So when you're calculating, they may give you all the trouble you need to calculate the depreciation expense. And if they don't give you any tax rate or they say ignore taxes, then ignore the depreciation. If they give you a tax rate and you have to sit there and calculate the tax shield the way we saw in that other example, then yes, of course you would go ahead and use that, okay? All right, good. Now, if they give you interest expense, ignore it because they're going to give you a discount factor that is going to consider the time value of money associated with that particular project. So don't worry about calculating uh, cash, uh, don't worry about calculating interest expense. You then discount the cash flows, and then you're going to go ahead and compare the present value of the cash inflows to the cash in, uh, outflows. And if that number is positive or zero, you will accept that project because it's implying that you are now getting the rate of return on that project associated with that discount rate. If they have a negative uh, uh, net present value, that's telling you reject that project because you're not getting the return associated with the discount rate that you used in that problem, okay? So let's just go ahead and uh, look at what the book says about what I just said. Okay, so interpreting the net present value method, and I don't know, if you feel you need the flashcards, you can, these will be optional flashcards. I think you know this, I think you just know this because you're an accountant and accountants walk around with this kind of stuff in their head, but positive result equals make investment, um, or if it is um, zero. So they say the result is positive greater than zero, zero or greater. Zero means you're getting exactly that return. Okay. So zero or greater, accept the project. Negative 
means that it is less than zero, obviously, that means that you would reject the project under the net present value method. Okay. Okay, good. Again, whatever the rate is that you use in that is determined by management. So if you're sitting there saying, well, do I have to calculate the interest rate? No, management makes that decision based on what risks and also considerations of inflation can also affect the rate that they'll use. But they'll give you the discount rate on that. They'll say, assume a discount rate of X, and then the expectation is that you're going to have to go through and know how to use that, applying it to the different cash flows that we've talked about. Okay. Now, if we have one rate that is applicable to the entire problem, that's great. That makes our lives a lot easier, but that's probably too easy for the CPA exam. So on the CPA exam, they'll probably use different rates for different time period and different time periods and different amounts of cash coming in at different times. And so you're going to have to roll with those changes that occur over time in the life of the project. And uh, that would make it a little more complicated for us, but uh, there's not a whole lot we can do about that. We have differing rates. We're going to have to deal with them. Okay. So let's just look at this problem here. Okay. And um, they tell us um, that this McLean is considering the purchase of a new machine that'll cost 150,000. Okay, now when I see that in a question, I'm writing that down on my scratch board. I know that I'm gonna have to probably use that number, right? To calculate the net present value. So you, you maybe don't know right now, this is a net present value question, but um, you will by the time you get to the end of it. The machine has estimated useful life of three years, assume for simplicity that the equipment will be fully depreciated for tax purposes. And it's gonna be 30% the first year, 40% the second year, 30% uh, the third year, thanks a lot. It'd be a lot easier if they give me a constant depreciation, but I'm just going to have to roll with that, right? The new machine will have a $10,000 resale value at the end of the estimated life. The machine is expected to save the company $85,000 per year. You're going to see something like that in questions. Otherwise, why are we doing this? Okay, we're not buying a machine to look at it. Okay, it's supposed to you know, increase our cash flow. The claim uses a 40% income tax rate. And here we go, 16% hurdle rate for its capital projects. Okay, and that hurdle rate is basically the required rate of return in order to accept the project. We use that rate and that's how we're gonna come up with our present value factors. Now they give us different factors and we're going to have to know how to apply them to the different years worth of information that was given here. If it's an annuity, that means what? That means we have a steady amount of cash that's going to come in year after year. So I'm thinking that 85,000 is a good candidate for an annuity because it says it's going to save that amount per year. It would be nice if we could use the annuity factors for some of these others, but these others unfortunately what unfortunately come in at different amounts over the years so we're probably for those going to end up having to use these present value of dollars and that's going to require more calculations okay so they tell us that present value okay and so let's just go ahead and take a look at how we would have worked this so we take the cost of the asset and uh, they tell us hey go ahead and calculate the tax shield first. So for year one and three, right? Cause it was 30%, that's gonna be 45,000 times of depreciation times the tax rate means we're gonna get to shield 18,000. If we don't buy this machine and we don't have this depreciation, we're gonna have to pay tax on any income that we have of 45,000 for year one and three. Uh, 60,000 for year two. So we have a $24,000 and $18,000 tax shield, tax savings, it's often called shield savings, and that we don't have to pay tax on that amount of income because of this depreciation. Why? Because we bought this machine. Question. 
on that. Okay, good. Then we have the annual savings. That's the reason we're buying this machine, 85,000. One minus the tax rate. Notice you use the tax rate when you're calculating the depreciation shield. Notice it's one minus the tax rate when you're calculating the cash inflows net of tax because we have to pay 40% tax. So we only get to keep, right, 60%. So our annual savings after tax is 51,000. Then we go ahead and we're going to calculate the salvage value inflow. And so they're assuming that they'll sell it for 10. They're assuming it was fully depreciated. So there was no book value. So the gain on the sale is the book value is zero. So the gain on the sale is 10,000, but we got to pay tax on that. So there's a 6,000 after tax uh, cash flow that comes from the salvage value. And then we just have to turn that into present value. And so notice we spend 150,000 that goes out in year zero. Now, again, be careful. If there was a discussion of a working capital tie up that would happen at the what at one there's no discounting that happens at the beginning. And then when that working capital is released at the end you'd have to discount that but this problem didn't do that to us okay. Then what for year one we've got the tax shield that we calculated the savings is the same and. We could have applied the annuity factor, but I agree with the way the solution showed this. If you've got different cash flows in different years, it makes no sense to calculate the present value of the inflow. That was a consistent amount, but then have to sit there and deal with these uh, different things coming in, the tax shield and the tax, uh, the salvage value at the end. Um, I, I agree with just doing it a year, per year and then doing your discounting using the appropriate factors for the appropriate years, one, two, and three. Year two, okay, then we had 24,000. Year three, we have to, uh, we now have to sit there and uh, bring in the uh, after tax uh, cash inflow from the sale of the equipment when we're done using it. You go ahead and you discount that. These are totals here, guys. I probably should have shown that a little better, but those are totals. We add those up and then we do the discounting. This project has a positive net present value that says do the project because you're getting a, what return are we getting on this then? Theoretically? Was it at 16, I think is the percentage? Right, 16%, whatever the discount. Uh, whatever the the uh, discount rate was that was used uh, to discount the cash flows to come up with the factors. Yeah. Okay. How can we get a discount rate? What? How can we get the discount rate per year? It was given to us in the problem. Yeah, the discount rate. I'm not sure. You refer to it as a hurdle rate. Same thing. Discount rate, hurdle rate, synonymous terms here. Okay, 16%. And then we start discounting the cash flows using that 16% rate. And the if the number comes out positive, that means we hurdled the rate. We met the rate that we want here. Okay. Yeah. So the, the problem has, to, I mean, they may, I mean, I, I haven't seen this. Theoretically, they could not give you the rate. And then you would have to sit here and, um, you know, just use these factors to come up with the net present value. But I haven't seen problems where they don't call out the rate and tell you that these are the rates associated these are the discount rates associated with this percentage rate. Do they make you look it up at a table or do they actually just give you the, the rate typically? What they like to do is give you a couple of different things in the problem itself to see if you know what to go to. For example, we didn't need this really, right? 
you had to know that you had to cheat, treat each one of those cash flows as a one-time thing. If they gave me a problem in which they were telling me, um, well, here's the rate. Like, let's say they say the company's interest rate for borrowing money is 11%. And they give me the discount factors at 11%, but then they say the discount rate for the company is 16%. I'd have to know to use the 16%. You don't use the borrowing rate of the company. You use, we're looking at rate of return here, right? Not the interest rate that they pay to borrow money. It's rate of return. So they could give you a problem What I'm trying to say, they could give you a problem with a couple of different rates in there you need to know that you pick up the factors associated with the discount rate. They could theoretically want you to do some sort of Excel thing where you have to figure out, but I don't think so. Generally what they do is they sit there and they just want you to know by reading the problem, it has more to do with reading comprehension guys than anything. They want to know that you know you have to pick up what the discount rate associated with the project, the hurdle rate that the company requires, like we said, ignore the interest rate for borrowing, interest expense. That is not part of the consideration. Question? Okay, good. Now, they uh, come over on the next page, okay? And in typical, you know, CPA exam fashion, they may, and again, this could be, huh? Where did I go now? Where am I? I could have gone to the next page. Okay. They could ask you in some sort of multiple choice question, or maybe even. They could ask you uh, what are okay. what are the limitations of the net present value method. Maybe they should be asking what are the limitations of this software. Okay, so the limitations. God damn. Okay, the limitations. Now what? Oh, shut up. What is all this? Okay, the potential limitations is um, that uh, it simply indicates whether the investment will hurdle the rate used in the net present value calculation, okay? So it, um, you know, is not going to sit there and tell you what the rate of return is on this, unless you so happen to be lucky and the net present value um, so happens to equal zero by some miracle, then if it's zero, that's telling you, well, that was the rate of return. But what you're really looking for is the positive net present value. That tells you, like in our example, the rate of return was more than 16%. Uh, I know because it had a by law of mathematics, it had a positive net present value. Let me do something, guys. I'm gonna take a chance. I did this once already. And it worked for a second, but then the thing started acting weird again. Um, yeah, I better discard all that. Close Matt's question. And let me go back. the file. I just want to open it, please. See if it'll reopen. We might be able to have that problem go away. Oops, but I need it in the uh, annotator.
seems like every term I have at least one time, right, where the thing starts acting up. And sometimes I just have to get out of the whole meeting to get it and I have to reboot, but let's hope that doesn't happen here. Where are we going? Someone's taking us for a ride somewhere. Okay, good. So let's see if we can get this to start acting right, although it still seems pretty slow. Okay, good. So we see here, we say, okay. Take the investment if, you know, it has a positive net present value. Now, what happens? That would imply that we have unlimited capital to pursue every single opportunity that has um, a positive net present value. Well, that's not necessarily the case. We could have limited capital, okay? So, realistically, company probably has realistically limited resources that make its investment choices mutually exclusive, unless you're uh, Amazon, you know, then I guess you can spend money going to the edge of space just to look down and fall back down. Okay, but what happens, you sit here and you could uh, still use, even though they're saying, hey, you know, you can't pursue everything with a positive net present value, but you could use this as a ranking tool in which you sit there and you say, okay, I'm going to list my projects by net present value positivity, highest net present value. I'll do that one first. If I still have some capital left over, I'll go to project two, still have some capital left over project three. And you just go down the list going in descending order from the highest net present value to the lowest until you run out of capital, right? So, you know, it's not like you can't logic your way around this. Now, the other way that you may want to rank projects, okay, is to use something maybe a little more sophisticated called a profitability index, okay? And the profitability index is the ratio between the present value of the cash flows, hello, the net present value, okay, of the cash flows, divided by what? by the cost of the investment and the present value, they get a little silly with that. The present value of the cost is generally what is generally what the thing's going to cost you now to uh, buy it. And so then you could go ahead and rank the projects by profitability index. Okay. So that may be another way. I just did it straight by um, net present value. Uh, highest to lowest when I was saying about ranking, but maybe a smarter way to do that is to come up with this profitability index um, because if you have to put out a big chunk of money, then maybe a higher net present value isn't as uh, great to you, okay? So you come over and they give you an example of how to use the profitability index and you know they talk about application up there i don't think we need to read through that that's a little bit uh, a lot of words somebody got paid for the word for the word on that because what happens you sit here and you take the what the cash flows present value of the cash flows are going to come in the initial investment you divide them that gives you the profitability index and then you rank the projects by profitability index so what's project number one B. Project number two is going to be what? E, I guess here, 1.6, and so on. Okay. Question? Okay, good. So you can work around some of the limitations that they talked about there with net present value. All right, good. Let's take a look at a few questions here then. 
And I'm going to fight this, it looks like, for the rest of the night here with this slow machine. Okay. I mean, I sit here and I yell at my computer when it's not doing things as quickly as I want to. Meanwhile, the poor thing is usually on 24 seven. Maybe I should shut it down sometimes and let it relax. Uh, but let's go ahead and let's just take a look at this first one. Okay, guys, I'm going to go ahead and put this up um, in the poll, show the answer. We've got a few folks that no matter what I do, they're not going to choose one of them. So, okay, and let's go ahead and let's take a look at the um, results here. And good. Uh, most of us, almost everybody tried it, got a good uh, answer here, which is B. Okay, now when we look at this question, um, you know, you kind of look at it and it's like, okay, what would I consider here in my net present value calculation? So equipment replacement decisions, which one of the following does not affect the decision process? In other words, something you're probably not going to use in any of the net present value calculations that we just talked about, assuming you're, you know, using net present value. So current disposal price of the old equipment, no, that's a cash inflow that comes at the beginning. Original fair market value of the old equipment has nothing to do with it. I don't care what the original fair market value was of the old equipment. And I hope, you know, we didn't pay an amount that was too much different than that original fair market value. But once we paid it, we paid it. It doesn't matter anymore. Okay. The cost of the new equipment, absolutely. That's probably the biggest number in the calculation. Operating costs of the new equipment, well, yeah, when we, and we didn't really look at it in any of the examples, but when we're looking at the net present value, we look at the cash inflows are going to be generated with that, but there is a potential that there'll be some operating costs associated with that, so we would subtract that off to come up with the net cash inflows, presumably the reason that we invested in this was that there'd be more cash coming in that is being used up by this option. Okay. Okay, good guys. Let's look at number two.
Who are the three that refuse to answer? Who are they? The three on every question. Kathy, are you, I, I think you're muted. Yeah, I think I am. I, I didn't I didn't see it. I'm sorry. I was looking at something else. Sorry. Oh, okay. That's all right. I got distracted. Your uh, participation level is fantastic, so don't worry. Um, I just have this. I just picture two students that are like in bed right now. <laughs> with the covers over their head going, no, see me. <laughs> and it's just kind of like, guys, that's not the way to do it. You got to jump in with both feet into this stuff. Okay. All right, guys, let's go ahead and let's take a look at this one. And this is pretty straightforward. I mean, almost everybody got it right, 80%, which is a good percent. Okay. Um, but let's just go ahead and take a look at this and uh, when the risk of the individual components of a project's cash flow are different, an acceptable procedure to evaluate these cash flows is to, and we saw this, just discount each cash flow using the rate uh, associated with the uh, period of time when those different cash flows come in. Um, you know, it'd be nice if cash flows were good little boys and girls and just, you know, came in exactly the same amount period after period, but nothing in this world really works that way. So you're just going to have to deal with it accordingly. Now, the CPA exam may give you one or two of those just because they want to see, do you understand the idea of present value and using it to make a decision? Uh, but if you end up with a problem with different amounts, you're going to have to use different rates associated with different times. Okay, good. Let's look at different cash flows for different periods. Let's go ahead and let's take a look at this one. Okay, I'll give you 10 seconds. Okay, good. Uh, yeah, this one's pretty straightforward too. I think we all got this one right, or most of us got this one right. 82% of us, 14 and 17 got it right. Somebody didn't try, but um, let's just go ahead and take a look at the question now. And uh, we can see that if the net present value is positive, it indicates that what? That the rate of return for the project is greater. Now, if it was zero, which almost never happens, only in textbooks does that happen, that means that what the rate of return is what? is equal to the discount rate. But if it's positive, that means that we're getting a return that is greater 
than the discount rate. The discount rate is a rate that management comes up with. I don't know. Maybe they use the capital asset pricing model to come up with what their return is it needs to be on a project. But that's something that management determines. They come up with that and then they use that rate. And if it's positive, that means the rate of return is greater than that discount rate. Okay. All right, good. Let's look at question four. Oh, you didn't put up the poll. Yes. Yep. I got it. Sorry. Oh, Guys, this one takes time. There's no reason to rush. Set your problem up carefully. You get a heck of a lot more out of tr trying to think through the question. I'm gonna give you a little more time than just trying to rush through and flip out something that Does it reinforce what we've been doing here? I'm gonna give you three minutes because I could see a question like this, maybe taking you three minutes on the exam to get it right. So take the time. Okay, let's go ahead. Let's take a look at this one now. Um, this is a question that might take you, as I said, a little bit longer. Um, but my rule for questions is if you're going to get a question wrong, do it quickly. Okay, if you're going to get a question wrong, do it quickly. Do the, get it wrong quickly. D the worst thing is to spend a bunch of time and get a question wrong. Okay, so that's why you need to be somewhat systematic 
about the way uh, you go through a question like this, okay? So what I do when I get, you know, a present value example question that I'm looking at, I say, okay, I know that I'm going to have to look at the cash flows. So I go and I look at the cash flows. And Okay. And I know that I'm going to look at the cash flows now. I know that I'm going to have to use a present value factor because I can see them up there. And then I'm going to get the present value of those. And then I'm going to sum that present value column, outflows, inflows. That's going to give me the new present value. Okay. So you look and they say Salem is considering a project that yields an annual net cash inflow of 420,000. Now, when I look at that, I say, well, okay, that's gonna be 420,000. And they tell me that it is what? A cash inflow annual for years one through five. So I take that, I know I have to multiply it by a factor, and now I've got to pick up the right factor, and that's an annuity, isn't it? If we're going to have an amount that's going to come in per year, for years one through five, so I pick up that present value of the annuity factor. I know i got to get that in there. Now notice when I look at the question, guys, I use the ninja approach. I use the energy of the question against it. I don't sit there and say, well, where's the factors? Huh. and start swinging wildly at the question. They gave me that. I take that. Take the power away from my enemy, right? Okay, then what? You know, I know nothing about martial arts, by the way. So I could get, I got beat up by a bee today, okay? I beat myself up trying to kill a bee. Okay, so what happens? A net cash inflow of 100,000 in year six, okay? So that means that I'm going to have what? This 100,000, but that's going to be a one time thing that's going to come in in year six. So I look, do they give me huh, present value of a dollar? Yeah, that's a one time. I know that that's good for one time because what? Because the number there is less than one. If the number is more than one, then I know I have an annuity factor, right? And you can kind of see how they're giving me factors in the problem. I'm not having to go to the table or anything. They just want to see, do you know what um, factors to pick up here? Okay, really, that was what this question was all about. They say that the project has an initial investment of 1800000 Okay, good. That one's easy because I don't have to really discount that. But I'm just going to stay consistent with my table here and say that it has a factor of one, okay? And then they tell me Salem's cost of capital is 10%. Like I said, maybe man that's something that management comes up with using the capital asset pricing model or something. And then they give me the present value information. I gotta use it. This is all they give me to do this. And so I started doing my math on these. And what happens? I have these positive inflows. By the way, this is going to be a negative amount, right? It's going to come out at the beginning. 1,591,000. Got that one. 100,000 times 0. 0.56 is 56,000. By the way, guys, don't you dare do any of these calculations in your head. That's why you have a calculator sitting there, okay? Don't mess up by trying to, you know, please your second grade teacher to show her that, you know, you didn't have to show her or him that you didn't have to use a calculator for these, okay? You use the calculator. And when you do the math on this, right, if I did my math correctly, I should get 152,200. Is that the answer? Okay, now you got to do questions like this in a systematic fashion, guys. If you sit here and you jump all over the place trying to do things and you don't write it out systematically like this, I promise you, you're going to line up the wrong cash flow with the wrong factor. You're going to add when you should subtract something. 
and the examiners are laying tracks in there that consider the kinds of mistakes, careless, not careless, but pressure mistakes that you might make as you're going through this. I know you're not being careless, but pressure mistakes is a better word that you might make while you're going through this. Question? Yes. Um, I was noticing in the text from before, um, they talk about present value and they talk about net present value. Is really the distinction just the cost, the subtraction of the cost of the outlay from the very beginning or? Well, that's net present value is what you see here. Net present value is after you've calculated the present value of those cash flows, the difference between the inflows and the outflows, right? Okay. I, I just, it seems like the terms are being sort of used interchangeably. And I just wanted to make sure I understood what I was talking about when, because the profitability index, for example, uses the present value of cash flows and it doesn't say. Yeah, that's why I said, I said net present value. Profitability index, I would use net. They should have said net present value. Now, if the project only has one cash flow, I guess, then maybe you would use, uh, you know, only positive inflows. And I guess you could just use present value. Net present value contemplates that there's inflows and outflows. But for the profitability index, if let's say I was trying to do the profitability index on this thing, I would uh -huh. take 152,200 and divide it by the 1,800,000, right? Which is the initial investment. Okay. So you wouldn't just, cause see the way I read that, I would have taken just the cash inflows and done that uh, by the, by the uh, 1 million eight and divided that by the 1 million eight. So I would have, I would have done that wrong then. Oh, well, wait a minute. That's a good question. Hang on a minute. What page is that on? Profitability index? Uh, it's on page uh, um, 76 and 77. And they talk about the application, but they just give you sort of what the initial investment is and then the future inflows. But I don't know if those future inflows contemplate the subtraction of the initial investment or not. So that, that was kind of my question. Just that I knew what I was actually yeah. looking at. Here. I think you're right. Um, because, yeah, you're right. So I think I did this wrong. So you would just look at the inflows here. Because this is kind of... Okay, you know, so then the, the, dis point eight. the so. distinction then would be the, the present value of the cash flows is just the stuff coming in and then your initial investment is not considered in that because well, your outflow is then in in the in the denominator well almost. instead of the numerator for that ratio okay oh stop almost because if a project has outflows that are going to happen during the project so yes you're right right right, right. right. But it's not just inflows, it's net inflows that would come because maybe there's some costs associated with the project, right? Exactly. Right. So it's, to track those, but it's, yes. To it's the point. NPV with respect to everything except the initial investment. Correct. Okay, got it. Sorry, That's I was just trying to wrap my brain around what it was I was actually a, looking at. It's a good question. I mean, I'm not thinking through all these. Different I'm also putting you on the spot for which I apologize. <laughs> no, that's fine. I mean, if I know the answer, I know it. If I don't, then I'm going to pretend my computer is not functioning. No, I'm just kidding. If I don't, <laughs> then I'm going to tell you I don't. But yeah, you're right. Because if you divide it by the 1.8 and you subtract the 1.8, that's not right. Because you don't consider the initial cost of an asset as a as an expense of that asset or a cost of that asset, you know, a subtraction from the cash flows that are being generated. So yeah, to get the uh, present uh, profitability index, you wouldn't subtract the initial investment in calculating the present value of the cash, present value of the future cash inflows, but don't ignore costs that might there might right. be 
costs that might be embedded in that middle section that has to do with your if they tell you the annual operating cost of this thing yeah those are going to be x but then kathy be careful don't subtract the depreciation okay calculating those operating costs because depreciation doesn't use cash right <laughs> excuse me okay okay now let's go ahead um because they kind of squeeze in there this lease or buy decision thing here in the middle of this and i want to really get us to the internal rate of return okay because i know that there's going to be some questions regarding internal rate of return whereas this lease versus buy you can look at that and spend some time with that um it's not that difficult but I want to make sure that we have sufficient time to consider internal rate of return. Okay, so let's just jump down to that on page 84. And forgive me, guys, I'm going to definitely reboot my computer. Maybe I'll let it sleep tonight. Um, let, it get, let it get a little rest. Okay. And all the updates? <laughs> Maybe there's an update missing. I don't know. It just tends to get like this. Where it's hard for me to regulate um, how fast I'm going with things. And then I go past it, and then it wants to go back up, and it fights itself to go back down while it's trying to go up. And, uh, okay, let's do it this way. It's going to just do it right. How annoying. Yeah. Okay. What I'm going to do is go a little slower, I think. Why did I jump to the page? I don't know, but that doesn't seem to be going to work either. Almost there. Okay. Okay, good. All right. Internal rate of return. Okay. Let's just take a look here. So now what we're going to do with the internal rate of return is determine the factor that yields a net present value equal to zero. Now, let me just um, point out here the IRR method is focused on the decision maker on the discount rate at which the present value of the cash flows equals the present value of the cash inflows um, and the, uh, uh, the cash outflow, I should say. The cash outflow is generally the initial investment. So, what you're going to consider is well, what is the net cash flows that are going to come from this project. You're going to multiply that by what? By a present value factor. Okay, that's going to give me what the net present value, isn't it? And that has to equal the initial investment. If that's the case, think about it, guys. That's the same as saying that the what the cash flows equal the net present value. In other words, what factor is going to generate is when you discount the budget when you multiply by the, the cash flows that are generated will equal the initial investment. So the way you'll come up with that present value factor, just doing the algebra, is to take the initial investment the initial investment
and multiply it by the present value factor. I mean, excuse me, multiply, uh, divide it, damn it. Sorry guys, this whole thing is just kind of going nuts here. Divide it by what? By the net cash flows. Now, once you get that factor, then you can take that factor to the present value table and you can what? You can run your finger along for the number of periods. They'll tell you how long the project is, the number of periods. Run your finger along the number of periods until you find that factor. And when you find that factor, you come up and that's telling you what the internal rate of return is. And once you know that internal rate of return, you can use that to decide whether or not you want to do the project or not. And you're going to use as a hurdle rate, a factor that management has set up is what they want for return in order to accept a project. So if the what, if the internal rate of return, let's just look at the next page. If the internal rate of return is greater than the hurdle rate, then you should accept the project, okay, equal to or greater. They never say equal to, because I guess they're assuming it'll never be equal. Reject the project if the internal rate of return is less than the hurdle rate, okay? So again, the thing to flashcard is this, of course, so you know what it means, but also flashcard this, you don't have to derive it every time. Flashcard this right here, that to come up with the factor for calculating the internal rate of return, you're going to go ahead, take the initial investment, divide it by the net cash flow. That's going to give you the present value factor, right? And I just proved that for you right here, because that's the factor that will cause the net present value to be zero. And then you're going to go ahead and once you find that factor, then find the interest rate. You come for the row is the number of periods. The appropriate interest rate is the one that lines up under that uh, particular factor. Question for the net cash flows. Um, would, would those just be the sum of the cash flows? Like if we go back to the other example, kind of sad they didn't give us an example here, but for example, the, the, the thing that we worked before, would it be the, you know, the 420 each time plus the 100? Would those be the cash flows? You, one of the um, limitations, and I'm not, I'm not ignoring your question because your question feeds into what they're saying next, okay? The limitation is that what cash flows generated by the investment are assumed in the IR analysis to be reinvested at the internal rate of return, okay? And uh, inflexible cash flows, which, um, which addresses your question, the timing or the amount of cash flows used to determine the IR can be misleading when compared to the net present value method. IR is less reliable than net present value when there are several alternating periods of net cash inflows and net cash outflows. So what we see is that they assume highly unrealistically that the cash flows are essentially going to be the same each period because it just would be too complicated to sit there and try to deal with different cash flows coming in at different speeds because how are you going to get to that factor? So it assumes it assumes like just the five year period where it's 420 each year. So would you use the 420 or the sum of the 420? Cause you're getting the whole shebang. No, not the sum, the 420. The 420 is what you'd use. Okay. Yeah. Because then the, the timing and the repetition of it is incorporated in the rate. Okay. Right. They got it. But that's a highly unrealistic example. Yeah. Uh, assumption. Both of these are, um, but you know, Companies can use these as screening. You know, I always tell my students in when I'm teaching this at San Jose State, San Francisco State in cost accounting, I tell them, look, you know, you could do all this, get a negative net present value and still decide to buy the thing because you decided you want that, you know, new equipment. So, you know, I mean, there's a lot of factors that go into 
the consideration of this uh, that could cause you to just go ahead and pull the trigger on this anyway. Okay. Okay, good. Um, now, let's just go ahead and quickly, speaking of, you know, very basic methods to make these decisions, payback method, okay? And all payback method does, and no, you're not having deja vu here, in which notice we take the what average incremental cash flow that was at 400 and whatever it was we were using in Kathy's question and we divide it by the initial investment gives me now I'm saying instead of it giving me the factor now I'm saying hey it gives me the payback period now the answer is coming out in years okay and all I would do is then compare that to the um, you know number of uh, of uh, years that I've set up as a hurdle rate for years, if you will, and if I say I'm not going to accept any project in which I have to wait more than five years to get my money back, then if you look at a project and that number comes out to be greater than five, you reject that project. The number comes out to be less than five in that example then you might go ahead and accept that project, okay? Now, if you have uneven cash flows, non-uniform, call it cash flows, in an example uh, that they show you here, well, if it's non-uniform cash flows, then it's much easier to adjust for that when we're talking about the payback period, because you just wait until you've accumulated enough money to cover the initial cost of the project. So if the initial cost was 200,000, this project's gonna pay back what? With uneven cash flow sometime in year three. So it's a lot easier to adjust for non-uniform cash flows under um, payback method than it is under internal rate of return, okay? So advantages of payback, easy to use, disadvantage and the big one is it ignores time value of money okay it really uh, that's the advantage and the emphasis on liquidity disadvantage where's my disadvantage limitation it ignores the time value of money which is a big disadvantage to me okay okay good so with that I think we have time for one more question. Well, let's do, let's do, let's see if I do two minutes per question, that's six minutes. You guys won't hate me if we go two minutes over, right? Nope. You're like, well, we hate you anyway, John, so go for it. <laughs> Okay, so let's go ahead and let's just jump and look at a couple of questions here. I'll tell you what, for the first two, I'll give you one minute and then I'll give you two minutes for the last one. How about that? Two seconds. Okay, good. Let's look at this one. Um, okay, most of us got it right here. The answer is B. 
the payback rule ignores all cash flows after the end of the payback period. You just want to say, hey, when are we going to recover our investment? Is it in enough time based on whatever we've determined time we need to recoup our investment? And it ignores the fact that there may be $10 million that's coming, you know, in the fifth year. <laughs> Wait a minute. <laughs> you know, you rejected the project and you're not getting your money back in three years. Meanwhile, there's this $10 trillion payoff in year four. Right. Okay. All right. Good. Let's look at the next one. Okay, guys, I'm going to go ahead and cut these off. Looks like we're getting tired, but um, the answer here is A, okay? Um, it ignores uh, the time value of money, okay? All right, good. Let's just go ahead because I want to try this last question. So let me relaunch the poll here, and let's go through this last one. Good chance to work with this one a little bit, and we'll get out of here. Or you want to do it together? Together would be nice. Okay. Yeah. I'm for together. All right. So let's get the poll out of the way then. Okay. The one person who did it got it right. Very good. <laughs> Whoever you are. Okay. And let's go ahead and let's take a look at this. Okay. And they want to know which one will recover in three years. Okay, so we look at this first one, Project A, and Project A, they're kind of making that easy for us because they say, hey, 10,000, you divide it by what? Even cash flows, so we just divide it by the 3,000. That's 3.333. Is that going to recover in three years? No. no. So that's a no. For that one, so if I'm, you know, pressing for time on, what? Oh, I'm sorry, I was just saying that's a no. Yeah, if I'm pressing for time on the exam, I can get this down to a 50-50 shot, right? Okay, but it's not that bad because I look at project B and yeah, they gave me some uneven cash flows, but look, if I get 15,000 in year two, and I get 15,000, I don't know when it's gonna happen in year three, but it's gonna happen at least by the end of year three, then I will have recouped what? 30,000 and the initial investment is only 25,000. So yeah, that project's going to recover in three years, isn't it? And then I look at project C and hey, you know, only two cash flows to deal with in the third year, by December 31st of the third year, they were gonna have gotten, you say, how do you know it's December 31st? Well, I don't know. It could be January 1st, could be December 31st, but they're gonna get it by year three, right? And so, uh, yeah, project C is also a yes. Or I thought the answer ended up being C. Oh, I don't know. Then whoever chose C got it wrong. Gotcha. That's why you wanted to do it together? No. Or are you just like doing it together? <laughs> together, I was a little bit confused on this part. Easy, but for some reason I took that out of there in a second. Well, yeah. it's a little confusing because they gave you five years and you could have gotten, you know, trapped into doing it all for five years and then go, oh, wait a second. They only want to know what happens in the first three years. <laughs> well, 
Well, you always got to read what the question wants. Yeah. Never jump into a table. Um, there's some people that believe you should go straight to what they call the call of the question. I tell you, I've tried that before. And every time I do, I'm like, okay, now I have, I have no idea what they want. So let me read the question. So I feel like I waste time by doing that. But um, you should definitely read the call. You know, if you're one like me and you like to start at the beginning and go through and then see what they want. Uh, you definitely need to see what they want before you start crunching the numbers. Yeah. Okay. Question guys, we're a little bit over. Okay, so don't forget guys, there were a couple of modules there that I, you know, I just I can't see us getting behind the eight ball here in our time just for me to sit here and read formula to you. Okay, and show you how to you know how to apply them. So take a look at the video for that. Um, take a look at the flashcards. If you are seeing a missing flashcard for one of the formulas that is relevant to the questions that you're working, add that. Okay, and that will keep us on track so that next time we can make pretty good headway in chapter three. I think you'll see that chapter three is largely a review of your managerial and your cost accounting. And so we should be able to move through this and keep ourselves in pace to get through every day. I have a question in general about studying. I mean, certainly as we go through the homework, we discover that we are better at some subjects and better at certain types of problems and worse at other types of problems. So how can you is there a way that you can kind of call the Becker materials so that, or so that you can get some extra practice on some of the types of problems that maybe you're not very good at? Yeah, when you start a set of multiple choice questions, it asks you, do you want to work the, um, the incorrect questions, ones that you got incorrect, and you press that button, it'll only return to you the ones you missed. But I mean, if you would like to try some more examples of ones like the type that you missed, you know, because like maybe you always miss a certain type of problem. I mean, I'm I'm wrestling with some of the computations simply because I never use a calculator. And when I do use one, I use a 12C. So I'm constantly flipping stuff backwards. <laughs> I'm having to use, learn how to use a calculator again. <laughs> well, use a calculator um, and keep practicing <laughs> with that. Um, but um, no, there's not more questions that are there other than the ones that you have, except for you have questions in the final review. So the idea is that, you know, I don't know that a person has 